Hey, this is Jessica from goodenoughandstuff.com. Let's make some tarts. The sun could go out, we're gonna be okay. If all the blue skies make to gray, we're gonna be okay. Okay, so the first thing you need to do is identify the agarita berries correctly. They look like a holly bush, but the biggest difference is Agarita berries are ripe in spring, specifically May through June, sometimes as far as July. Holly berries start appearing in August, so not the same time of year. They have grayish green leaves that grow in groups of three and have very spiky points all along the edges. This makes the berries literally a pain to pick. I used that joke in a text to one of my friends, I hope she thought it was funny. The berries grow in clusters all along the branches and are bright red and round when ripe. They also have a little black button on the bottom, which is just the dried up flower that came before the berry. There are several small seeds inside that are pretty woody, but edible as well. Around February through April, you'll find little yellow flowers on the bush that are supposed to be really fragrant and kind of smell like honey. I didn't check that fact this year, but you better believe I'll be smelling all the flowers next year. The berries can be eaten right off the bush or made into jams and jellies. They're tart and sweet, and in my opinion, taste a lot like Granny Smith apples. They also taste a lot like the red huckleberries you can find in Washington State. I picked those a lot when I was a kid. Once you're sure you've got agarita berries and they're ripe enough, it's time to pick them. The method that most people use is placing a sheet under the bush and then whacking the branches with a long stick. Then you collect the berries from the sheet. This works well if you have a very full bush and a bunch of them are all next to each other. What we found to be pretty successful is to hold a large bowl underneath a branch, position it with tongs, and then smack it with the tongs. Some of the berries bounce back out and you'll get some green ones too, but this method allows you to move from bush to bush pretty quickly. There were a ton of little black beetles all over the bushes, and we ended up smacking a lot of those and some other little bug friends into our bowl. Please enjoy this montage. Once you've got a good amount of berries, rinse them a few times and pull out all the leaves and critters in there. And you don't have to be too precious about getting every single little tiny thing out because you'll be straining the skin and the seeds out later anyway. My first attempt at cooking these, I picked out every little tiny stem and sorted all the green berries out meticulously because I was planning on cooking them like cherry pie filling. It didn't go very well because there were just too many seeds and they were really woody. It tasted really good, but I just couldn't get past the seeds. But then I just squished it through a sieve and it was great. The world could fall down, it's gonna be okay. The sun could go out, we're gonna be okay. For this video, I'm making a jam that's more like pie filling, but if you want to learn how to make the jam or jelly for canning purposes, I have a recipe in my blog post and it's really easy. I'll leave a link below for that. To make the tart filling, throw about four cups of berries and half a cup of water into the blender and blend it just until the berries have all burst. You don't really want to pulverize all the seeds. Then smush it through a fine sieve. I ended up with like an applesauce consistency, but you can use cheesecloth if you want the juice to be clearer and pulp free. You just need at least two cups of liquid when you're done. Combine the berry juice with one and a quarter cup of granulated sugar and then bring it to a boil over medium high heat. In a small bowl, whisk together two tablespoons of cornstarch and two tablespoons of water. Pour the cornstarch slurry into the jam and continue to boil and stir until thickened. Okay, let's start the crust for the tarts by mixing two and a half cups of flour with half a teaspoon of salt. Cut in one cup of shortening using a pastry cutter or two knives because you don't want to use your hands to mix it in, otherwise the shortening will melt or just get warm and you don't want that. In your measuring cup, mix one tablespoon of vinegar and five tablespoons of milk. This makes the milk curdle and mimic buttermilk. Pour that mixture into the bowl and mix with the spoon until it looks mostly distributed. It's still going to look pretty dry. But you can squeeze it in your hand to make a dough ball that stays together. Then it's mixed enough. Flour your work surface and pour the shaggy dough out. Now you just want to smush it together enough that it can be rolled out. It doesn't have to be consistently smooth. You're not looking to knead it or work it very much. The less you work it, the more tender and flaky the crust will be when it's baked. 
You can see here that there's still cracks in the dough, but there's also a lot of streaks of shortening marbling the dough ball. That's exactly what you want to see. You don't want the shortening to be completely mixed in. Now separate your dough into manageable pieces if you have a small work surface like me, and wrap the remaining dough in plastic wrap to keep it from drying out. Or you can roll all of it out at the same time, whatever suits you. Make sure you reflower your surface, then roll the dough until it's about an eighth of an inch thick. I tried to shape the dough into like a squarish shape to see if that helped with rolling it out into more of an even rectangle. It didn't. And I'm more concerned with not overworking the dough anyway than just rolling it into just the right shape. And that gives me a good excuse to not be too precise. If you get little bits of the dough sticking to your rolling pin, just smush them back in and then use a little bit more flour. So the goal here is to cut out about 24 squares out of all the dough, and that includes any dough that you set aside. This will give you 12 tarts in total. I'm using my finger as a guide, which makes them roughly 3 inches by 3 inches, although I am not very good at measuring evenly, so you'll see that. What you see here is a real clear example of my struggle with straight lines and symmetry, but I did not recut these or re-roll them or anything to make them better, and you've seen how good the whole thing turns out. So if I can make them look that good with like really wonky, uneven pieces, then just imagine what you can do. I went about these next steps in kind of a weird order. I should have put 12 squares on the pan, evenly spaced out, and then rolled out 12 more, but I was just kind of doing whatever at this point. Just make sure you have an even number of squares at the end, and it's important to cut the slits in half of them before you pair them together, while they're still kind of sitting on the counter. It's way easier than cutting the slits after you placed it on the top, and then all the jam was like squishing out. Spoon one to two tablespoons of jam into the middle and leave space around the edge with no jam. If your top square isn't quite the right size, like a lot of mine were, just pinch the edge around to make it a little bit bigger. If it tears because of the slits, just smush it back together and just make it work. Use a fork to press the two halves together and really press it in. Don't worry too much about the jam leaking out. I found that the jam didn't burn even though it did leak out on several of the tarts. It might burn if you decided to put a lot more sugar than I did. Just something to keep in mind. Something that I forgot to mention earlier is that you only really need half a batch of the jam for one batch of the dough. Here are the finished 12 tarts. You can see that in some of them there's quite a bit of patchwork going on, but I just love that. Bake at 400 degrees for about 18 minutes until golden brown and bubbly. Let them cool for about 10 minutes, then mix together one cup of icing sugar with two tablespoons of milk and drizzle over the tarts. Then enjoy! Thanks for watching my video. I hope you liked it and I hope that you can find some agarita berries where you live. If not, just go outside and find something. If it's mulberries or blackberries or dewberries or blueberries, strawberries or something, but spring and summer it's the time for just going out and foraging for things. Even if you have to dig around and eat some roots of something, that's still cool and fun. And just do your research, make sure that you positively identify things so that you're not eating something that's poisonous or make you sick or even be fatal. So be careful with what you're looking for, be, be sure. It's best if you can find someone who has identified it already and eaten it already and like knows that it's right and good. Make sure you're being careful, but once you are sure, go out and do it, you know? It's a lot of fun for your family, it's a lot of fun for your kids, and it's a lot of fun for you. I just realized that I never actually recorded saying goodbye, so please go check out my blog, goodenoughandstuff.com. You'll find the printable recipe there and a bunch of other fun stuff, and I will see you next time. Bye! There she was, there she was